Welcome to Shrink Wrap Hawaii. Boy, have I got a show for you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist here in Hawaii. And with me today, I have Dr. Dean Nelson. Welcome, Dean. Oh, Thanks aloha. for coming on the oh, show. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Steve. So, yeah, it's, I'm really glad I did, and I'm really glad you accepted it. It was all kind of last minute. Yes. And, um, Serendipitous. Right. Somebody once said if it wasn't for the last minute, nothing would have happened. <laughs> and no, really, it's a surprise. And I'm thinking, is he really going to show up? He, I mean, here you are. Right? And he showed up, you took over, it's all yours now. <laughs> so you sent me all this information uh, that I just read about two hours ago about your life. And mm -hmm. I thought the most interesting piece for me was the little piece that you sent around, I guess, to the people that were going to your high school reunion? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's uh -huh. how I <coughs> found out that you had also been a dancer. Yes. Uh -huh. So, <coughs> all, right, all right, you know, you know, remember that show, you know, This Is Your Life? Yeah. All right, so This Is Your Life. <laughs> where, where did you Who's go? Who's going to traipse in? <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> Who's going to traipse in? Yeah. You remember little Marie? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> when I pulled the angel wings off of him. No, okay. <laughs> Where did you grow up? I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm an, an original Norwegian bachelor farmer. I'm from oh. Lake Wobegon. Oh, what? No kidding. Yes, absolutely. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. what, what town? St. Paul. Paul. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, uh, and how'd you get out? Uh, I heard about airplanes. <laughs> Uh, it's, it, I know it sounds true, but at those point, uh, only uh, wealthy people flew. Right. And, uh, and uh, I had lost my scholarship in football, or my ability to play football, and I found out that I couldn't afford the school I went to. Where was that? I went to a small uh, college, the only one that probably let me play, called Luther College in Decorah, Iowa. And so then I had to pay for my own schooling and... Uh, you, but you got a football scholarship. Well, let's just say it didn't cost me anything to go to school there. They uh -huh. never called them scholarships in those well, days. Well, what position did you play? I played uh, wide receiver and I kicked, I returned kickoffs. Oh, and, so you uh, can run. Yes, I'm, yeah. I actually was very fast. Uh -huh. Very, very fast. So I, you left there. Yes. And then what? Came here. I came to Hawaii when I was how, 19. How, why Hawaii? What was well, the connection? I don't, you know, there was a profound underground. This is, of course, most of people my age, I'm, I'm We're assuming. We're about the same? Yeah. We're influenced by the Vietnam War. That right. was what marked you as a male. You had to figure out what you were going to right. do about Vietnam. Yeah. <clears throat> In those days, Hawaii, University of Hawaii, had no out-of-state tuition. Do you know oh. what it cost me to go to school in Hawaii for well, one semester? What? Eighty-six dollars and twenty-five cents. <laughs> well, that was your like your registration fee or something. Yeah, that was yeah. no, that was your whole. That was fee. it. That was tuition. That was tuition. <laughs> so yeah. it was like stay cold and maybe go to Vietnam and stay in Hawaii or, f or in Minnesota or fly to Hawaii and stay in school and continue studying. Let me go that again. You know, it was just like wow. So I got on my first plane ride and came. So to you Hawaii. knew nobody. I knew no one. Wow, yeah. that's chutzpah. 1968. <laughs> yeah. Again, a chutzpah and stupidity. Maybe there <laughs> <laughs> chutzpah has some sort of bravery. This was just uh, stupidity. Wow. <laughs> or and ignorant. you were studying what? I did the basic anthropology, sociology, the I don't know what I'm going to be when I grow up <laughs> courses. Uh-huh. Yeah. And then what? Well, then I ran into a brilliant teacher of the Dons, who's still here. Uh, someone I consider my mentor and still my first teacher, quote unquote, Betty Jones, uh -huh. of Dance As We Dance, and uh, I started studying dance. And, and then all of a sudden the, all the lights went on because now I could use the physicality that I was really longing for that I missed from football with artistry and with the full discipline of everything on board. What, so you, you were a dance major? Uh, well, they didn't have a dance major in that period. Uh -huh. So I finished my degree and then I went on to get my MFA. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. At yeah. UH? No, I got my MFA from Utah, University of Utah. Oh, with a concentration in dance? It, it was, um, yeah, choreography. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, I'm a wow. choreographer or dancer or whatever. So then I started my own company. But that's all kind of sorted. Sorted? It was pretty sorted <laughs> beginnings, right? <laughs> From football uh, pretty to exciting. Dance. <laughs> pretty exciting. It was a very, very delightful way of spending one's youth. Uh huh. Physic to, you know, you only get a young body once. Right. It's beautiful. So, yeah, that was yeah. fun. And then what? Uh, well, then I had a 
a period where uh, I realized that I was 31 and where I was going to be at 40. Mm. And it was one of those crossroads, I think, maybe you hit at 30. And I realized that <clears throat> I didn't want to be either that physically in pain or that poor. And I made mm. a huge shift into medicine. And what did you do? I mean, how, I mean well, there how was, that happen? There were some years in there because I was scared of science. And so I sold real estate. And just kind of, I call them my lost years, where <clears throat> I just really couldn't put the pieces of my life together, quite mm. frankly. But I had fallen in love, and um, ah. I was in Seattle. And uh, anyway, it, it really was the discipline of dance. You and I have chatted a little bit before the show about <clears throat> the discipline of the arts. And I think classic musicians and probably dancers are some of the most disciplined. So I, a light went off that said, <clears throat> if you have the discipline to dance and what it takes, the everydayness and the pain and the, the, the poverty as well, you can apply that to anything. And mm. so uh, it took me longer or harder to accomplish the sciences because I had to go back and start all the way up at, to algebra. <laughs> Wow. To do the pre-meds. Well, you slipped something in there that uh, interests me. You said in Seattle you fell in love. Well, I, it's a lead, I'm sorry, there's no real short story. I met my wife at a Buddhist seminary. And <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like the name of a book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I met my wife at a Buddhist seminary, and at that point I had invested in a sailboat. I didn't have a house. She had a house in, in Seattle, so I moved out to, to be with her. Uh-huh. <laughs> Where does the sailboat figure? Uh, a bunch of guys got together, and a bunch of Buddhist guys got together and bought a sailboat. And we ran it as a charter business uh, down in uh, St. Thomas. Is this really where you want to be going? <laughs> <laughs> Did the wife come to St. Thomas? No, uh, I eventually gave up on the boat and moved in with her in St. Ah, uh -huh, so. uh -huh. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay, and so you started uh, with the sciences. You went back to undergraduate classes and stuff. And Actually, then... I didn't need to go to undergraduate. I just uh -huh. would, I did a crash course in what's called pre-med, uh -huh. which is all, it's all sciences, all the way up to physics and uh, calculus. And then what happened? And then, uh, and then I went into health field, and a, a light went off. It was one of those light went off because I had a prediction of all things by an astrologer. And he says, you're going to continue working with the body but with energy. Seriously. 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 And the light went out. I went to see a Cairo, and he's, I said, what the hell do you do? This is a weird field. He says, we work with the body's energy. And I went, I'm there. And... It wasn't totally chiropractic, however, that really uh, uh, excited me or uh, what I was passionate about. It was energy. And really, if you work with energy, the true authorities, in my opinion, on energy in the body are the Chinese, the Chinese medicine and Tibetan medicine. So eventually, I just, chiropractic was what my degree's in, but my real study was in Chinese medicine and Tibetan medicine. But, um, but you're a, a licensed chiropractor, yeah? I'm a licensed chiropractor, licensed acupuncturist, and unlicensed strange. <laughs> <laughs> so when did that become your full-time life? Uh, 1988. Uh, I think I was finished school with... Uh, in, uh, I started doing body work in 1988 and got the degree in 92. And so I've been doing that for 24 and years. And that was where? That was in Minnesota. I went back oh, you to... you went back to Minnesota? Yes, yes. My wife was a flight attendant for Northwest, and so we needed to be a base where she had seniority. So we oh. went there. Mm -hmm. And you stayed there till when? I was stayed there, and we came back here in 96, having adopted a child. And he's a brown person. Uh-huh. And Hanai. And I <clears throat> was tired of getting stared at and grocery stores and we wanted to in be... In Minnesota there. he was unusual. He was unusual, yes. Yeah, yeah. And so we were, we, and of course I was chomping at the bit to come back to Hawaii. Uh -huh. I've always considered this home from the moment I stepped off the plane. It's funny, people either get that feeling or they're gone in two years it seems. Yeah, that's right. It's almost <laughs> like you don't bother to get to know them for two years. I mean, I don't mean to be callous, but there's that <laughs> sense. There's that sense, right? Right, that right, 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 yeah. right, right. And so you, you felt like this was home immediately? Yeah, yeah. Actually, Kailua, right. 
Uh -huh. Yeah, when I, I went agree, to, when but I got my, don't say that. I I, the K-word. <laughs> K-word. Where Obama, the o, o right. stage, right? Right. Okay, so um, I, we rented a house on the beach when I went to school here in 1968. I was just going, there, there couldn't possibly be a better place to raise a family. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So I came back. So did you immediately start doing chiropractic work when you came back? I did. I, 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 uh, <clears throat> I opened a clinic in Poly Palms, and uh, because of the acupuncture and the uh, various uh, modalities I was bringing in, we, uh, it, I was lucky and we succeeded quite well. Is that what I read? Is that what the Windhorse? Yeah, Windhorse Healthcare. Uh huh. Where? That's a combination of all the things you do? Windhorse is a, a Tibetan word meaning lungta or uh, the chi, the life force that oh. powers you. And if you get that right in the body, most everything takes care of itself. So. And you do that with acupuncture and chiropractic? And the actual treatment modality, I mean, this is so sweet of you. The actual treatment modality involved a very strange and wonderful form of chiropractic called network combined with cranial, combined with acupuncture, combined with herbs. And then the key thing was, is I taught meditation every week at my... So you were almost... You were signing, if you came to me, it was because you wished to also learn about your mind and how your mind affected your body. And that was the, it still is the pivotal piece about my uh, approach to healthcare. That fascinates me, of course, you know, being a. Do you think? <laughs> the the mind-body connection, right? Yes. Um, yeah. That one was the one that was the most fascinating to me. Or yeah. It is to this day. You just came back. Yeah. You were gone for six months? Yeah, again, I, uh, what has happened is, uh, again, we had a, a wonderful life and we became empty nesters. And at that point, uh, I wanted to be on retreat more. <clears throat> I wanted to, uh, I think Haviv says it well. He says, uh, I've become a heroin addict for the sublime state. And mm. so, uh, <clears throat> At this point, I have been a Buddhist now for 40, um, 44 years, 42, yeah, 42 years. And uh, I wanted to be on retreat more and more. I wanted, I wanted my life empowered by retreat mind more and more. And so uh, now we go on retreats in an RV. We meaning? My wife and myself, who's uh -huh. also a Buddhist. Not that there's, I mean, anything particularly special special about being a Buddhist, but those are the trainings that we, we, we bring. So, so where did you go? Each year we kind of design something, you know, and uh, my wife had never been to um, the Canadian Rockies, so most of our trip this year was focused on the Canadian Rockies. But our idea is to, <laughs> is to we call ourselves site snobs. We, we try to find isolated pukas where, where we're... Uh, where we're alone and virtually can't see anybody and I'm not bothering anybody and also not bothered by anybody. So can you paint me a picture? Wait, I think we have to take a break. Okay. They're whispering in my ear and we'll, okay. we'll come back okay. uh, very shortly and uh, remind me I want to go back and I want you to paint me a picture of what that retreat looked mm. like. Mm -hmm. Okay, stay right there. Don't touch your mouse. Aloha, my name is Josh Green. I serve as senator from the Big Island on the Kona side and I'm also an emergency room physician. My program here on ThinkTech is called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'll have guests that should be interesting to you twice a month. We'll talk about issues that range from mental health care to drug addiction to our healthcare system and any challenges that we face here in Hawaii. We hope you'll join us. Again, thanks for supporting ThinkTech. For a very healthy summer, watch Viva Hawaii. We're giving you the best tips and with our best health coach here. So, viva health coach. Viva la comida saludable. Hey everybody, my name is David Chang and I'm the new host of a new show, The Art of Thinking Smart. I'm really excited to be able to share with you secrets on giving yourself the smart edge in life. We're going to have awesome guests and great mentors of mine from the political, military, business, nonprofit, you name it. So it's something for everybody. So, Dr. Dean, we left off, you were going to paint me a picture of your retreat. Tell yeah. me so I can have a feel for what that was like. The, the retreat is just so marvelous. After a while, the only kind of uh, quote-unquote um, 
help or a shrine room you could say that I need or meditation room I needed was nature. In some ways, from the very get-go, nature has always been my church. And it works very well with Buddhism, especially the kind of practices I was doing was just simply being nature. I, I said, because I was stupid, I really needed the power of nature to help me into this uh, state of uh, presence. It's, it's not particularly esoteric. It's just there's many, many, many levels of presence, of how to actually be present. And what opens up to you as you reduce the, disc, the neurotic speed of your mind, what, what opens the monkey up, mind. The monkey mind, right. So once you start to diminish, oh, this is an aside, but I just saw a scientific study saying that we think 50,000 thoughts a day. I figured that out, it's about one per second. I mean, it's really, really, really bizarre, 50,000. Most of those are completely dumbing down our game. They're just stupefying us. So of those, 90% are negative. Wow. And 95% of those are redundant. You thought them yesterday. So it's really a, a kind of a state of the mind. So at some point in my life, I wanted to just see what 25,000 a day seem like or something like that. Can you do that? Yes. There's no question. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. So our retreat is unique in the sense that we're we're not a place where you can meet you blend a little bit of life you could say we don't <clears throat> you uh, you blend a little of mundane mundanity meaning cooking and uh, and such with your life and walks and such but uh, i think the unique part about it uh, when i tell this to other men i i'm sorry if it sounds a little um i don't know humorous but is that we don't speak to each other. We don't even say good morning uh, until two o'clock in the afternoon. So it's like you truly are on a retreat. Mm. We just make our tea and then we're out and we practice. We do meditation practices until about one or two. And the silence part of it is, the, is, the, is one of the key things that's made it work. And so we're always in this astoundingly beautiful places. So we both find individual places where it's quite secluded and then we do our practices. So what would I see if I'm watching a movie of this Yeah. between, I don't know, 7 and 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon? Right. What, what, what am I going to see you doing? Well, I mean, the, the classic practice for first just reducing the amount of noise is called mindfulness. Right. Okay, that's just, and of course it's the darling now, but it, it's kind of considered a remedial tool for just getting the noise down to some level where you can have some joy in your life, mm -hmm. where you can actually be present enough to not be your own kind of worst enemies. And sometimes mindfulness is actually translated as making profound friends with yourself, which sounds simple, but if you say to somebody, you're going to be quiet for an hour, many and most people completely panic. <laughs> Right? It's true. It's true. So I was working with a client just yeah. the other day. She couldn't do five minutes. I had, I've had uh, Navy SEALs say they would rather go on missions in, <laughs> in armed forces than have to do meditation because it's so profound to actually meet your own mind. But there's really nowhere out but in. You have got to, at some point in your life, make... But still, I'm, I'm so, I don't know what this movie looks like. I'm okay. watching you so, do mindfulness meditation well, or whatever so, you're doing. So I what set up. Like? I said I get one dog. She gets one dog. I set up my red chair somewhere. A dog. D O G yeah. dog. Yeah, we take dogs with us on the retreat. Uh huh. I set up in the first hour. I probably do some sort of meditation, but I also work with intention and motivation. So I'm setting up intention and motivation. Those things. I'm really contemplating. What are you trying to do? What do you hope to affect? Can you give me a sample? Of when you're setting you, up intention and motivation. You intend to clarify your mind to benefit the world. <laughs> Simple stuff like that. <laughs> well, but, right? Don't you do that? Isn't that why you get up in the morning? Uh, I get up because I know I'm going to have coffee. <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, in some ways, you know, my teacher, I need a re positive reward to leave the, the word comfort of my is, bed. My is mantra. You get up, the mantra, <laughs> coffee is the word mantra. Coffee, coffee, coffee. Yeah. That's it. Okay, so you got up for the word mantra, but then you go, now you go, okay. And then, I, no, I have it very, yeah, my, I don't uh, know if it's, see, I'm talking about myself. I told you that's my fault, right? No, I love it. Much easier So my, <laughs> my, 
my routine, okay, or whatever you want, like ritual, yeah, to give it a highfalutin word, is the coffee. Yeah. Then I do what some in some circles is known as morning pages. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, I write Julian Cameron's words. A thousand words, words right, or two thousand right, right, right. words or whatever. Uh, but in November, I call it Nano Rimo. Do you know about that? No, I don't know that. There's one. this project of writing a book uh -huh. uh, in one month. Every oh. year that's done by tens of thousands, if not hundreds, around no, the world. Oh, I didn't know this. It's called, and you submit it, and some of them get published. Wow. Um, so huh. that's the goal to write. For me, it's 30,000 words in 30 days. No. Right. Yeah, so oh. I, I'm doing it. Yay, Steve, this month, you know. Yeah, I so think, uh, it's the same thing, though. It's my morning pages, right? So I just sort of stream of consciousness. Well, stuff. the word you used was really. Uh, we have a ritual. I have a ritual that yeah. I go through, and I actually do have a morning meditation with tea. And actually, that literally is probably the first thing I do is just literally drink tea with precision and utter appreciation. And open my senses to the beauty of the birds or the waterfall. I mean, we're always in these outrageous places. Well, yeah, and I live on Kailua yeah. Beach, and yeah, so, so that, I, call that, I do my writing, and then I go there on go. the beach with the dog. Yeah, yeah. So it made me feel better about this nonsense now. I mean, it's my, you know, it's not nonsense. Do you, don't you love it? Would you want to total, live, would total, you want to live your life without it? Uh, yeah, I, would, it I wouldn't want to day? die, but I, I, I really appreciate it. You and I'm grateful okay, so for you it. set your day with appreciation. You have these rituals and then meditation is just another form of heightened making your entire life a ritual. In right. In some sense. Right. So there, does you want a more, more of the movie filled in? Yes. Okay, so then then once I do those practices... So is it that you're... Do you, um, I, I'm interrupting again, yes. I'm sorry, but uh -huh. I really want to know what it looks like. So are you sitting on a log or no, walking no. with the dog? What no. are you doing? We've got these 9.99 folding chairs that you get at Walmart, uh -huh. and, and sometimes I take a cushion with me depending on what kind of posture I want to take, and I usually get one dog, she gets one dog. I've done my tea meditation, I set up motivation, intention, and then, quite frankly, I'll spend some time on lineage, your line of juice. For instance, in any Hawaiian uh, uh, protocol, you're going to listen to lineage chants first and foremost. The folks that you've got to thank for getting you there. So then I'll do lineage chants of some sort. Which your are quite ancestors? My ancestors. Quite frankly, my lineage chants is very vast at this point. And you flesh those out almost like friends, to tell you the truth. They become, uh, they literally become uh, a part of your retreat, these lineage holders. So you think about each one of these people? Do you say their name? I can say them very doing? fast or I visualize them. It depends on if I want to spend time with that particular aspect of my practice. But, so are these... But lineage um, is very important. Like blood relations or people who have taught you or all the... Most of these above? people have taught me, but certainly Jesus is there, Buddha is there. Uh, for instance, you know, people who have... The people who have given their lives to see the goodness and love and aloha is said, I thank those people. Uh, I bring them into the retreat. But what about your biological lineage? Yeah, like yeah. Your parents and people Yeah, they're like in that. there too. They're, uh, and, I mean, you're, you know, your family, if you think about it, your family, they're, ro they're rooting for you. Mm. They're rooting for you. They're rooting for you, mm -hmm. right? They're rooting. I hope so. so. Yes. No, you don't even hope. <laughs> they want to see you succeed. So yes, they're there, but they're not quite as high up as some other uh, individuals. Do you have a set? Do you do the same people every day? Oh uh, no. No, changes. different people pop up, but okay. uh, the, the, again, I'm just establishing the ground. Then I do relatively, I'm trying to look for, then I do start doing what's called deity and some esoteric practices having to do with uh, body and yogas and things like that. <clears throat> Mantra right. practices, they're sometimes called sadhanas. The main one of which I do is medicine Buddha. Ah, tell me about medicine Buddha. Well, that I would like to, you know, I thought about it. I wonder if they asked me about Medicine Buddha. At, at some point in the, in the development of humankind, a thought came that it is a, a, a marvelous thing to care for one another, to actually try to help somebody get out of pain. Mm. That took an awakening. Mm. And that lineage that you could think of as the first medicine woman, the first medicine man, the shaman, 
that tradition, sh shamanic, that tradition of us trying to help one another out of pain mm. took a Buddha, took an awakening. Buddha means awake. So that practice goes back to that level of antiquity and covers all the way up to Dr. Uh, blank blank now it's a lineage of people who actually wish to care for one another and get them out of pain so that's the lineage of medicine Buddha so I looked up medicine Buddha right? yeah and I saw this guy sitting like this blue <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah so is that the guy the first guy he was actually considered a human at some point but now it's more like a uh, force uh-huh an awake force of compassion, uh, caring. I mean, if you think about your health care givers, it's a pretty extraordinary field, yours, yours included. It's extraordinary that one would want to spend their lives trying to fit, help people out of their different morasses and pains. Well, yeah, I mean, it's selfish too, right? Because it's heal thyself. That's, that's a good point, yeah. Uh, I yeah. think that's it's why... A, it's its own journey in that sense. That's yeah. why I'm in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which goes into a whole other realm of interconnectedness, right? Which is what we were talking about uh, uh -huh. uh, Sunday. Yes. The, the interconnectedness, and you're, you're talking about this um, illusion of separation. Yes. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? You know, can, can, take me back a little bit. What we illusion is well, this feeling that we're a separate that we're separate from the rest of the world. Yeah, most of your psyche, most of those fifty thousand thoughts that you have a day, are to cover up this fear that you're separate. Yeah, you were talking about how we use all this energy. Yeah, you use you to use a create tremendous this myth. Amount. You've you've created a myth that you're separate and then 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 once you've created this myth that you're separate, then you have to go around and protect it and maintain it for yeah. the rest of your life. I mean, there's many times you must end up at the end of the day and the only thing you can say is that you survived. You <laughs> you survived. You, the big you, the big me, the big I. I survived. Really? That's what life's about. So at some point that becomes really, really fishy. Mm. Be the reason it becomes fishy is because of pukas. It's all about holes. There's holes in this fear-based model of protecting yourself where aloha comes in, where mm. love comes in, where brilliance comes in, where luminosity comes in. And because you aren't, because the you could say the ignorance that created the separation in the first place isn't as smart as the intelligence that made that paradigm. These pukas, there's holes where this, where aloha comes in. You know you're built from love. You know you're built from aloha. What a beautiful place for us to end with aloha. Aloha, everybody. Join us again next time on Shrink Wrap Hawaii. Thank you.